Well, welcome to Church Online, City on a Hill. My name is Pete, pastor here at the church, and it's a joy to welcome you to our online service. It's uh, so wherever you're joining from, uh, great to have you connecting, and uh, especially to the to the mums. Happy Mother's Day! I heard a story of a of a, a, a science teacher in, in in class teaching about the power of magnets, and to introduce the topic, he said to the kids, "Okay, kids, uh, what am I?" Uh, my name begins with M and I pick up lots of things. And one of the kids put their hand up and said, your mum. <laughs> and, uh, but mums, you pick up after us. You do so much work for us. Thank you for being great mums. Well, we're in a, a series just now entitled Encounters with Jesus, where we're looking in the build up to Easter, uh, the, the climax when Jesus has died on the cross and risen again for our souls. Um, we're looking at when people have these encounters with Jesus and the impact it makes in their lives. And we're going to look at quite a challenging one today. We're going to look at the, the contrast between Peter and Judas. So let's pray and then we're going to turn to the Bible. Thank you, God, for your goodness today. Thank you for this bright and sunny day. Thank you for your love for each and every person. Thank you for those joining today, Lord, who are on that journey trying to figure out you. And I pray for anyone who hasn't yet got a relationship with you that in these times together they would find you and i pray you'd build up the faith of believers and meet with us and help our faith to grow we ask you mighty god presence yourself with me here and with everyone as they're joining online or listening to this afterwards we ask it in jesus name amen i'm going to start with a story about a chinese church leader called wang megdao wang megdao was a Chinese church leader in the 1950s. And he had, he, it was a time when churches were being oppressed by the, the communist state and uh, church leaders were being identified and arrested and put into prison. And Wang Mengdao was, um, he had several close encounters with the, the communist police, uh, but managed to, so far, evade capture. His, his strong stance was to have freedom of religion, to, to be able to preach the Bible, to be able to follow Jesus, to be able to have church without state control. But what was happening was the state was starting to control the church and churches that didn't go along with their control and control what pastors preached on and control how churches met, churches that didn't go along with that regime would end up in prison. So, but eventually the time came after, one Sunday after he'd finished preaching, he got home and around about midnight, the communist police uh, rocked up at his house and arrested Wang. Uh, he was put in prison for 53 days in a filthy prison cell. And during that 53 days, he, he faced intense um, interrogations and he was constantly being fed the information about all his followers and fans who were now being arrested and who were suffering prison. And uh, he was under such pressure. And eventually under the pressure, he gave in and he agreed to renounce his convictions and to renounce and to sign up to the state-controlled church and to become a preacher for the state-controlled church. Um, it was a, it was a, he'd signed a, a confession that he was a counter-revolutionary and having done so, he was allowed to go free. But when he got free, he wasn't really free. He was tortured on the inside because he'd given up on his convictions. And uh, some of his friends said, you could hear him walking around saying, I'm Peter, I'm Peter. And then other times he said, no, no, I've acted like Judas. I've acted like Judas. Eventually he, he got in touch with the, the communist leaders and he said that I only renounce my faith and renounce my convictions because of the pressure that you were placing me under. I do still hold to the convictions I believe and I will not be adhering to the state church. It wasn't long after that, seven months passed and then he was rearrested. And in 1955, he was put in prison again. But this time it was for, sorry, 1957, he was put in prison again. And this time it was for two decades. It was a tough time. He was in confinement. He was placed under huge pressure. But after two decades, in 1980, the prison doors opened and 79 year old Wang was released. He sent a message to his prayer supporters throughout the world and he said, very many, many thanks to all of my brothers and sisters throughout the uh, in the Lord who have been praying for me. Please tell the brothers and sisters all over the world that during 22 years in prison, I've sometimes been like Peter, but never like Judas. He went on to say, 
I had no Bible, no pulpit, no audience, no pen and paper. I could do nothing. Nothing except get to know God. And for 20 years, that's the greatest relationship I've ever known. Sometimes like Peter, never like Judas. And that's my prayer for us, that sometimes we'll be like Peter. We're gonna make mistakes, but we've got that ultimate undergirding love and faith, but never like Judas. Never like Judas who betray Jesus and renounce our faith. Let me take you now through the narrative. This is when uh, Jesus announces that Peter and Judas are gonna deny and betray him. This is in the Last Supper, Matthew 26, verse 21. While they were eating, he said, truly I tell you that one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, one of you who has dipped his hand in the bowl will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray Jesus, said, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. And a little bit later on, shortly after, he then turned to Peter. This is recorded in Luke's Gospel 22, and it says, and, and Peter had, had, had announced, Lord, I'm ready to go to, with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. So here's the Last Supper. This is the time Jesus has with his disciples, and he announces to the disciples, to their shock, that one of them was actually going to betray him. No one believed it, no one saw it coming, no one even suspected that was in Judas's heart or motive. And then shortly after, Peter having declared, Jesus, I'll, I'll even die with you. Jesus then goes on to tell Peter, I tell you tonight, you're gonna die me three times that you knew me, even before the cock crows. Such a challenging, what happened next was they, they left the, the Last Supper, they crossed across the Kidron Valley to the lower parts of Mount of Olives, and there in, the, in the, what's called the Garden of Gethsemane, there Jesus and his disciples gathered for the last time. And it was there that Jesus was in torture in his soul as he was aware of what was coming next. And he and his disciples were praying. And then as, as they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, then Judas arrives. And this is what it says in Matthew 20, 26, verses 47 to 49. Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a, sign with, a signal with them. The one that I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And so Judas and this mob then take Jesus away, and Jesus then faces the first trial. The first trial is with Caiaphas and the Jewish authorities. And there Jesus is brought before this mock trial and Peter kind of follows close at a distance. And then he comes into the courtyard outside of Caiaphas's headquarters. And it was there at the courtyard as he's warming himself beside the fire, that one of the people who were there said to Peter, surely you're one of Jesus's followers. Peter denies it and then, but another person said, no, no, you're definitely one of Jesus's followers. And again, Peter denied it. And then again, you see this, this moment where G Peter says to the, the onlookers in Luke chapter 22, Jesus replied, man, I do not know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crows, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly tragic moment. Peter's absolutely devastated at his denial of Jesus, realizing he was so full of bravado that then he capitulated when the pressure was on. What happened next was that Jesus was then brought before Pilate and then before Herod and then back before Pilate and then he was finally condemned to be crucified with the Roman crucifixion. And then he rose again on the third day Judas, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, was so full of remorse. It says in, in Matthew 27, uh, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is this to us, they said, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Jesus threw away the money into the temple and left. And they went away 
and hanged himself. Absolutely desperate. Judas, full of remorse, ended his life in the most tragic of ways. So here we see this contrast between Peter and Judas. And actually the Bible is full of contrasts. All the way through the Bible you see two types of people. You see the saved and the lost. You see um, parables in which he talks about the two paths. The narrow path that leads to life and the broad path that leads to destruction. You see the two fruits. Good fruit and bad fruit. You see the two harvests, the wheat and the tares. You see two humanities in Christ and in Adam. And you see two destinations, heaven and hell. And you see both Jesus and uh, so J Judas and Peter, he was these two human beings, and you see the contrast in these two people. Uh, they were both sinners, absolutely, both flawed human beings like us all. Both sat at the feet of Jesus, both listened to his teachings, both admired his teaching, both followed him, both witnessed his miracles. I mean, they'd seen the incredible things. And both had their feet washed by Jesus at that Last Supper. And I guess that, that's a picture in many respects of the fact that when Jesus died for us on the cross, he washed our souls and he paid the price for everyone, whether they're willing to accept him or not. And both felt great sorrow over their actions. But Judas's life ended in absolute despair. But Peter went on to become this great apostle who preached on Pentecost and birthed the church and wrote great letters and changed the known worlds of his time. So how is that? I mean, how is it one life ends in utter despair and the other goes on to change the world and fulfill their purpose? Well, I've got three questions just as, as we kind of, in the second half of this message, three questions that we want to reflect on just to ask ourselves. So I want to sometimes be like Peter, but I never want to be like Judas. Well, three questions to reflect on. Question number one, what grips your heart? What grips your heart? Let's go back a few days earlier before the Last Supper. And Jesus is at another meal, and it's at that meal where this incredible act of worship happens. He's at a meal, and there at the table is this lady called Mary. And she has this very expensive perfume, and she breaks it and pours it over Jesus as an act of extravagant worship and appreciation. And this is, what, this is the interaction that goes on. Mark 14, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Then, this is a few verses later, then Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and betrayed, to betray Jesus to them. Isn't that interesting? What triggered Judas's desire to betray Jesus was this act of worship by this lady called Mary. She, she had given up this perfume in, 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 a, in a moment of appreciation. She gave up a year's worth of perfume in one moment as an act of appreciation. She valued Jesus so much she was willing up to give up this year's worth of perfume. And in contrast, here's Judas selling Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, which in those days was the, the price someone would pay for a slave in the market. So Judas sold Jesus for the price of a slave for 30 pieces of silver. And in contrast, Mary was willing to give up in a moment of worship, a year of salary. What was going on here was this. Judas had an issue with money. He had a huge issue. He was full of greed. It says in Mark 4 verse 19, that the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things can come in and choke the words in your soul, making it unfruitful. In other words, your faith, your, your walk with God, your the spiritual relationship you've got with God can be choked um, by desire for other things, by idols that our, our souls can chase after, by desire for money or desire for um, things, things of this life. It can so captivate your heart that can literally, it can strangle the spiritual life out of your soul. And that's exactly what was going on with, with Judas. He was enamored by money. He was enamored by possessions rather than with Jesus. What grips your heart? To give your soul to anything other than God is spiritual suicide. And that's what Judas did. 
He was so close to Jesus. And he spent three years with Jesus, the greatest person ever, the greatest one ever. And yet he was so far. Uh, there was a kid who kept falling out of bed every night. And uh, he kept doing this night after night, kept falling out of his bed. And someone said to him, why is it you keep falling out of your bed? And he thought for a moment and he says, I think, I, I don't know, I guess I stayed too close to where I got in. And I think that's what it's like with many people when it comes to faith in God, that they kind of have this, and I think it was like that with Judas, he kind of, he flirted with the idea of Jesus, but he didn't go deep. He didn't allow his heart to be captured. He didn't allow God to change his life. For him, it was just a religious experience. It was just a hobby. He wasn't in a relationship and his life wasn't changed. Now, in contrast, Peter had his heart gripped by Jesus. Even when he blew it, his heart was still gripped by Jesus. So this is now after the resurrection. Jesus has died on the cross and risen again. And Peter, strangely, it's recorded in John's, 20, John's Gospel, chapter 21. Strangely, Peter says, let's go fishing. Does the other disciples, why on earth? I mean, the greatest event in history has happened. The resurrection has happened. And you want to go fishing. Why would you go fishing? And, and I think he wanted to go fishing because, hey, yes, Jesus is alive. But I don't think he would want much to do with me. Because Peter was so highly aware that when it counted most, he had denied Jesus. And so when he's fishing, when him and his disciples, other disciples are fishing, they don't catch anything. And there on the shore, Jesus appears. And the disciples say, that's Jesus. And, and, and Jesus calls to them and, and says, cast your net again. And they pass, cast the net again. And they got this huge catch of fish, a miraculous catch of fish, just like it happened right back at the very beginning when Peter had started following Jesus. Peter realized it was Jesus. He swam to the shore and there it says, and this is what it says in John 21, and he found a breakfast waiting for them, fish cooked over a charcoal fire and some bread. So, so Jesus has made breakfast for the disciples. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? He's got this fish cooking over a charcoal fire. And then after breakfast, he has this interaction with Simon Peter. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question the third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. You have this beautiful interaction between Jesus and Peter. And you know, it's interesting. And this is a small but significant detail. There's only twice in the whole of the Bible, whole of the New Testament, that charcoal is mentioned. And the first mention of charcoal is when Peter was warming himself around the charcoal fire in that courtyard while Jesus was on trial. And it was there at that charcoal fire that he denied Jesus three times. You know how sometimes smells evoke memories? And here he is now again at a charcoal fire. And this time, instead of denying Jesus, he has three opportunities to affirm Jesus, just like he had three opportunities to deny Jesus. And I think this is a deliberate setup by Jesus to say, do you notice Jesus doesn't even mention his sin? He doesn't even mention, remember you denied me? He says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And the trajectory of Peter's heart was this, Jesus, you've gripped my heart. You mean everything to me. I want to follow you. It reminds me of the uh, story of a, a Japanese feudal lord called Wakazi no Kami. And uh, in 1854, as Wakazi no Kami and all of his military men were standing on the shores looking out at the European ships that had anchored off the coast of Japan. Their job was to monitor these European ships. And on that particular occasion, a, a, a book was washed up on the shore and it was a waterlogged Dutch version of the New Testament. Now, Wakazi no Kami could not understand this, so he did everything he could and he, he managed to source a Chinese version of the New Testament. And over the next 11 years, he starts reading it and studying it. Anyway, out of the blue, 11 years later, he turned up at the door of, a, of the first Protestant missionary in Japan, called, a man called Wernbach. He turned up at his door with 50 of his men in their full military regalia. And he said to Wernbach, I'm here because I would like you 
to baptize me and my men. We've all become followers of Jesus. And when he described to Vernbach the impact that Jesus has had in his life, this is how he described Jesus. He said this, I cannot tell you my feelings when for the first time I read the account of the character and the work of Jesus Christ. I've never seen, heard or imagined such a person. I was filled with admiration, overwhelmed with emotion and taken captive by the records of his nature and life. So what's gripped your heart? Do you love him? Why not just take a moment, just where you are, to reaffirm, Jesus, I love you. I think the world of you. You mean everything to me. So question number one, what grips your heart? But then the next question is this, how do you view Jesus? Let's, let's go back to that moment where Jesus announces to the disciples that one of them would betray him. And listen, and listen to how they refer to him. Matthew 16, as they were eating, he said, truly I tell you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they began, each, began, uh, each one began to say to him, surely not I, Lord. And that would have included Peter. Surely not I, Lord. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, this is verse 25, surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. There's only two occasions in the New Testament where we see Judas referring to Jesus. And on both occasions here at the Last Supper, he calls him Rabbi. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he comes to betray him, he says, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him in order to betray him. On both occasions, Judas calls him Rabbi, but Peter calls him Lord. In fact, the very first time that Peter met him, he called him Lord. For Judas to call Jesus Rabbi, I mean, that title is woefully inadequate to describe what he's just seen for the last three years of his life. I mean, Judas was there when Jesus fed the 5,000. I mean, when I say 5,000, it was 5,000 men, not including women and children. So there might have been 15,000 people. And he had this kid's pack lunch, uh, two, two fish, five loaves. And Judas was one of the disciples breaking those and feeding 15,000 people. He saw it multiply in front of his very, right in front of his very eyes. He, he was in the boat when Jesus came walking on water to the boat. He saw the dead people raised. He saw the blind eyes open. He saw the, the lame people walking. And he, and he calls him rabbi. I mean, it's wolf, woefully inadequate. Peter, however, calls him Lord. The first encounter Peter had with Jesus uh, it was a fishing encounter and he had this miraculous catch of fish. And this is what he says. It says in Luke chapter five, verse eight. But when Simon Peter saw it, this miraculous catch of fish, he fell down at Jesus's knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And then, and then again, we, we see this interaction where Jesus is asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? And in Matthew 16, we read this. Uh, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, that's Peter, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father who is in heaven. So Peter had this faith in Jesus. He knew he wasn't just a rabbi. He knew he wasn't just another, a guru or a good teacher or a prophet even. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, that faith... That understanding came as a gift from God. God revealed that to you. God gave you that understanding. So Peter's faith came from God. And also, Peter's faith was sustained by God. When Peter was told by Jesus, you're going to deny me. This is how Jesus said it to him. He said in Luke chapter 22, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as, as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers, that your faith won't fail. You need to understand if you have had this understanding of Jesus and you realize who he is, then that is a gift from God and that's a faith that's been given to you by God. And God doesn't give you that gift only to remove it at some future occasion. He gives you it and continues to give it and sustains you in that faith. Love what John Piper says, our assurance, our assurance isn't that God will save us even if we stop believing but that God will keep us believing. 
You see, Judas, he wasn't lost the day that he betrayed Jesus. That wasn't when he was lost. Judas was lost because he failed to recognize who Jesus was. He failed to recognize that he's the rab- he, he's, he's not rab- just rabbi, he's the Messiah, he's the Lord, he's the King. And then equally, Peter. Peter's salvation wasn't jeopardized when in that moment of stupidity he denied he even knew Jesus. Peter's salvation was assured the first day when he came before Jesus, acknowledged, I'm a sinner, and he called him Lord. And so with you also, that your faith isn't something you conjured up yourself, it's a gift from God. Have you had an understanding, have you had a revelation of who Jesus is? Do you know he's the Messiah? Do you know he's the Lord? Do you know he's the Saviour? It's that Saviour who will save your soul. It's that faith that comes from God. That faith will not diminish. That faith will not go. That's a gift from God and he will sustain you in that faith. Amazingly, even if our behaviour doesn't line up with what we believe. Because you weren't saved by works in the first place. You can't lose through bad works that which you did not gain through good works. You get saved by faith beginning to end. Now, your version of Jesus will determine if and how quickly you repent. See, a rabbi, just a good teacher, hasn't got what it takes to save you when you've betrayed innocent blood. But when Peter understood that he's the Lord and he knew that he was a forgiving Lord, for him, that enabled him to repent. And that leads to the last question. Point number three, will you repent? In verse tw- Luke chapter 22, verse 62, it says about Peter, he said, he went outside and wept bitterly. And in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, it says that godly sorrow brings repentance and leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Peter had godly sorrow. It led to a total turnaround. He repented, he totally turned around, his life was changed because he realized, wow, I am a sinner and I need a savior. Judas, however, had remorse and it led to despair and eventually suicide. But it wasn't just in those final moments that it counted. It was actually, it had been the pattern of these guys' lives all the way through the journeys. You're reading the Gospels, you're looking at Peter. It's obvious he's a sinner. I mean, he can make so many mistakes and he acknowledges it. But the strange thing with Judas, even when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, no one suspected it would be Judas because he hid it all. No one had any idea that his behavior behind the scenes wasn't completely right. He hid his sin. He didn't come to it. He didn't bring it into the light. He didn't ask for forgiveness. It's like a timing belt in your car. Every, every, every so often, you've got to t- change that timing belt because if you don't, it will blow and it can ruin your whole engine. Same also with sin. If you, if you keep it hidden, if you don't bring it into the light, it will build up and it can cause massive devastating consequences in your life. Uh, Duncan Ballantyne, who, who's one of the dragons in Dragon's Den, um, he wrote a book entitled Anyone Can Do It. And in his book, he describes an encounter he had with God. I came across this the other day there. I thought, this is, this is so fascinating. And, and, and this, it, it was in Romania at the time. He was in Romania and he was so impacted by the plight of the poor in Romania. And he says this in his, in his, in his biography. For me, the tears came about 10 o'clock at night. I went outside and found a quiet place at the side of the house. I couldn't stop the tears. My face was wet and my nose began to run. I was a mess. After many minutes, I began to get the feeling that I wasn't alone. It was, it was there and then that, I, that God said hello. I felt that I had been consumed by his presence, that something had completely shrouded me and taken hold of me. It was unmistakable. I knew who had come and I also knew why. It wasn't a spiritual thing, it was a Christian thing. And I felt I was being told, you've arrived, join the faith, be a Christian, this is it. It was so profound, I stood there stunned, considering the offer and thinking about what it would mean. I knew I wanted to keep on building up my businesses. I wanted to keep making money. And I also knew I wanted to keep carrying on doing the things that I wasn't proud of. 
I knew that I was never going to be this totally Christian guy going to church on Sundays. So I said, no, I'm not ready. And God said, okay, and disappeared. Wow. God made Duncan Ballantyne come to know you. People have this encounter with God, but you've got to repent. You've got to say, you win. <laughs> I'm yours. Have my heart. Have my future. Have my allegiance. I remember a few years back, I was in um, Robertson Avenue, just in the Slateford area of Edinburgh. And we were out doing this thing called The Turning, which is a kind of, it's an evangelistic question thing that we do with people. And I actually, I, was, I remember I was there, I remember the exact moment, and I remember my eye was, I, someone caught, I caught sight of this guy in the corner of my eye and I knew I had to go and speak to him. So I went over to this guy and I asked him this question. This is one of the turning questions. I asked him this question. I said, it's quite a challenging question. I said, if you were to die today, are you sure beyond all shadow of a doubt that you're going to be with God forever in heaven? And the guy was, he was noticeably shaken by the question. And, uh, and he started crying and he explained that he was on his way to take his life. So on the day I was asking him, if you were to die today, would you, are you sure you're going to be with God in heaven? He was on his way to take his life. And he said he had just given up his flat the night before, had given it over, ended the lease. He just got rid of his mobile phone and he was on his way to find a quiet spot. And he, he took out his pocket all these blades. He was going to cut himself. And so I, I, I started telling him about Jesus. And then he, he stopped me and said, Listen, where I'm from, I've been told that the things I've done can never be forgiven. So I was able to tell him about the greatness of Jesus, that there is a Saviour, there is a Lord. He came for you at Christmas. He came, came for you at Christmas. He died for you at Easter. He rose again on the third day. And through Jesus, you can be forgiven. Your sins can be wiped away. You can have a new start. And he started crying. And right there in the street, on the day he was going to end his life, he put his trust in Jesus and accepted eternal life. I'll never forget that moment. You can turn to Jesus. He can change your life. Will you repent? Wang Mingdo, when he got released from prison, he said, please tell brothers and sisters all over the world that during the 22 years in prison, I've sometimes been like Peter, but never like Judas. We're challenged by this because we see ourselves in these people. But the question is this, what grips your heart? How do you view Jesus? And will you repent? Will you turn? Will you give your life over to him? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your incredible compassion and love. And thank you for taking rough and ready guys like Peter and the disciples to demonstrate to the whole world that you're willing to accept any person and you can change any life, and no one is beyond your help. Even those who think they're Judases, not one person is beyond your reach, if only they would turn to you. And we've got, we will give thanks to you that you're a gracious God, you're risen from the dead, Jesus. Thank you, you did die, you did rise, and through you, grace, forgiveness, and new life is available. Thank you, God. Take a moment, just where you are, why not pray your own prayer? Talk to God. Maybe something I've shared today has triggered something in you. Why not take a moment to talk to him about that? And while people are praying, I want to give you an opportunity today if you're joining and you want to make your peace with God. You want to make things right between you and Jesus. Then this is your opportunity. Why not? I'm going to lead you in a prayer and you're very welcome to repeat this prayer after me. Just, just one line at a time. Pray, dear Lord God, Thank you so much for loving me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins so that I could be forgiven. Thank you on the third day for rising again. And thank you, you're alive forevermore. I believe in you. And today I choose to follow you. Be Lord of my life. You're not just rabbi, you're Lord. And I want you to be my Lord. Thanks for hearing my prayer and accepting me as your own. Amen. As you prayed that prayer, I know that God has heard you and he accepts you. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. If you're, if you're on the platform, why not click the button that says, I prayed that prayer, 
or if you're listening to this message on YouTube or Facebook or on a podcast, why not email us? We would love to hear from you and we will do everything we can to help you grow in that faith. If you haven't got a Bible, we'll make sure you're given one and we'll help you get connected either with our church or with the church near where you are. Let's worship. God bless.